David Ogilvy has been called the father of advertising, and few people, I think, would disagree with that. He was an inspirational leader and a brilliant educator who sought out, who nurtured, and who retained outstanding talent for his agency. He was a tireless evangelist for the power of creativity. But more than that, he also imbued in his business a moral sense of dimension. For him, advertising and creativity was more than just to sell products, but could make the world a better place. I can think of no better testament to his legacy than the annual lecture series, Ogilvy and Inspire, which Miles and I have the great honor of launching today. Of all the components of the Creative Act, inspiration is the most fundamental and yet the most mysterious. The word came to us from the ancient Greeks. They believed the artist in the act of creation was breathed upon by the gods. He, the artist, or she, that is, the artist, was literally inspired by divine breath. Now, 3,000 years have passed, and as the shrinks would say, we still don't have a better clinical model than that. So what is inspiration? Where does it come from? How do you engender more of it? These are the questions we're asking ourselves as it impacts our work every day, and we want to explore this in our annual lecture of series, Ogilvy Inspire, and we are out there looking for the most creative minds, the David Ogilvy's of our age. And by the way, if anyone is um, struck by the wind of inspiration in this very room today, be sure to tweet it using hashtag DO100. Creativity comes from a different power, which is the power to imagine, the power of imagination. Imagination is the ability to bring into mind things that aren't present to our senses. And we take it completely for granted. And yet, it's why we're sitting in a building and not outside on sand. It's why we wear clothes. It's why these uh, sessions are being recorded. It's why most of human culture is at it, as it is. It's why human culture is qualitatively different from all other forms of culture on the planet. You see, biologically, we're probably evolving, aren't we, at the same rate as everything else. Um, but culturally, human beings are in a different category. And we know this to be true. Um, I mean, if you've got a dog, I don't know if you have a dog. Uh, I don't mean to say that dogs don't have imaginations. I don't know. I've never been a dog. <laughs> Though I've been close to them. I prefer not to go into it right now, but I have. And, and I'm sure that dogs have some sort of imagination, but they don't manifest it, do they? they don't, they're not evolving culturally very quickly, <laughs> are they? I mean, you don't have to keep checking in with dogs, do you, to see what's new? You know, what, it, <laughs> what are you people up to now? You know, well, pretty much what we've always been doing, honestly. It's <laughs> I'm sure dogs get depressed, you know, but they don't listen to Radiohead. Do they? And, and drink Southern Comfort. You know, we do that stuff. And the reason is that uniquely human beings do not, I believe, see the world directly. We don't apprehend it directly. We apprehend the world through a veil of conceptions, through a veil of ideas, through frameworks of values, beliefs, forms of perception, which are fashioned by our communications with other people as well as from our own consciousness. And when we create ideas together, when we create values together, we have a culture. Culture is really the composite of our collaborative creativity. And it varies as much as our creative capacities are different between each one of us. But something very profound, I think, follows from this, which is that we literally create our own lives in a way that other species do not. Um, I mean, think of your life. Did you know 
really, that you would be living the life that you're living now when you were 15 and at school? Did you? Is this what you had in mind when you were a kid? You know, if it all goes well, you know, I'll be hanging out in Cannes at the advertising festival. <laughs> this wasn't the plan. Of course, you make it seem like a plan when you come to write your resume, <laughs> don't you? You impose a narrative structure on your life so as to impress prospective employers or educators because you don't want them to sense the actual lived chaos that you've been going through. <laughs> <In the, laughs> and so you say, no, as the night followed the day. And I give you David Ogilvie's brief biography as an example to inspire you. I won't read the whole thing. This is just some headlines from David Ogilvie's life. He was born in 1911 in England. He was educated in Edinburgh and in Oxford. He started his career as a chef in the Hotel Majestic in Paris. He went on to sell cooking stoves in Scotland. Uh, he then, because he was so good at this, was asked by the owner of the company to write a sales manual for the other salesmen, which he did, which was published and was described 30 years later by Fortune magazine as the best sales manual ever written by anybody. Uh, and then he emigrates to Scotland, to America, to become associate director of Gallup. In the war, World War II, he was on the staff of British security at coordination of the British Embassy in DC. After the war, he joined an Amish community and became a farmer on the East Coast. Um, and then he went on to found the world's leading advertising agency. As the night follows the day. The old familiar story from, <laughs> from Argus salesman to Amish farmer to leading executive on Madison Avenue. Well, it seems to be a wonderful example of how we create a life. You are creating your life.